Hello, you've caught me committing a survival horror faux pas. I'm replaying Resident Evil 4 Remake and have mulched through Sadler's final lines of defence, emptying shotgun shells into common grunts and exploding heads with magnum rounds like there was no tomorrow. Now I've infiltrated the refrigerated lair of the regenerators, or as Dave calls them. La 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 la. Problem is, I mulched too hard and now face these fleshy atrocities with a briefcase full of, let's see, eggs trout and some herbs. A great inventory if I was appearing on MasterChef, but I'm not sure this celebrity judge is going to be impressed by my fish omelette. Can you even attach a bioscope sensor to an egg? I broke the golden rule of survival horror. Don't waste good guns on weak enemies. Of course it's funny to vaporize a chicken with a bazooka. But ammo scarcity is no laughing matter. I've clearly lost my sense of fear and reverence, and the only way to get it back is to spend time with weapons that strike fear into the heart of every gamer. Weapons with terrible consequences. Weapons that misbehave in the hands. Weapons that seem just too evil to deploy. From the unreliable to the deplorable, here are seven weapons we're simply too scared to use. First up is Dragon's Dogma 2's Unmaking Arrow, another Capcom offering, but one so perilous to wield it makes Resident Evil 4's Magnum look as risky as a Magnum ice cream. Which is easy to use. For starters, the unmaking arrow comes at a deadly cost. It's sold in one lonely coastal cave in exchange for eight Worms Life crystals, which, for the uninitiated, are the crystallised blood of this nightmarish git. Oh, only eight lumps of a drake's incredibly well-protected blood, is it? It's like your mum giving you 50 quid of pocket money, but only if you can collect it from the back of a lit oven. But say you slay the drake get enough bloody currency to buy the arrow. It's only then that the really evil bit kicks in. The good news about the unmaking arrow is that it will kill anything with one shot. Ogres, griffins, hell, get to the final boss, whip out this bad boy and you'll be watching the end credits before he's had a chance to start monologuing. I should send some of these to Solid Snake. Bad news is, the millisecond you let this rarest of weapons loose, the game auto-saves and you're forced to commit to it. Miss with the arrow? It's auto-saved. Fire and hit a tiny enemy by mistake? Take it up with auto-save. Fire and hit an NPC by accident? Good luck explaining the concept of auto-saving to their grieving peasant family. The fear of the unmaking arrow is the fear of indecision. Who is deserving of such an easy death? Do you go drake hunting in revenge for all the hard work buying the arrow to begin with? Or should you bring it to a Medusa fight to stop yourself going the way of a garden ornament? No, I've got it. The worst monster you meet in Dragon's Dogma 2. Any pawn who bothers me when I'm just trying to enjoy my adventure. Justice. Our second entry is from Deus Ex Mankind Divided, a game so named because you spend a lot of it dividing mankind in half. This entry also works for Human Revolution, but I haven't got a clever bit of wordplay for that one. Yes, it's Adam Jensen, he of pointy beard and even pointier elbows. After being blown up and rebuilt in Human Revolution, Adam is now more household appliance than man. Think about it, with his magpie augment he can find lost car keys, with chemically resistant lungs toilet cleaning becomes a doddle, and with his optimised musculature he can dispense drinks, albeit an entire vending machine at a time. Hell, he spends so much time crawling around dusty vents you could strap cloth to his knees and he'd double as a human Roomba. But while reinforced ulnas may drive steel into your kidneys, it's not them that strike fear into your heart. No, that would be the Typhoon Explosive System, a network of launchers embedded all over Adam's body that, and I'm quoting the owner's manual here, simultaneously eject a volley of liquid crystal elastomer projectiles in a targeted 360-degree arc. 
translated into English, you're a shaken can of Dr. Pepper waiting for someone to come and yank the ring pull. That's actually a better metaphor than you might think, because like a shaken can of Dr. Pepper, I'm always tempted to use the typhoon, but I'm also terrified of the indiscriminate chaos of the thing. Adam Jensen, as I play him, is a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. My legs fall asleep from all the time spent patiently squatting behind tiny wolves, and my dedication to the Trank rifle is such that I have no idea what this other stuff does. Widowmaker? I mean, I'm assuming that doesn't do nice things to married bad guys. I want the trophies for zero alarms and no kills, and setting off a human grenade kind of runs counter to that, so I'm going to resist, play the waiting game, and instead enjoy a nice, refreshing can of... You didn't think I was going to be that stupid, did you? At number three, a bullet that isn't just worth its weight in gold, it has single-handedly replaced the world's finance system. Yes, in Metro 2033, a dystopian survival FPS that asks the question, what if the London Underground was somehow even worse, traditional cash money is worthless and people barter using military-grade rounds. I'm actually quite familiar with the concept of using money as weapons, spending quite a lot of my time lobbing two pence pieces at Delsin. For our hero, Artyom, it means he's literally shooting money from his gun. The high-grade rounds hit harder and perform reliably, not jamming the weathered Soviet weapons in the heat of a fight. But put your money where an enemy's mouth used to be and you can't afford the medicine or gas mask filters required to survive in the long run. You can't help but play Metro 2033 as an accountant, adding up what could have been after every kill. Tunnel mutant, boom, Mars bar. Encampment of subterranean fascists, bang, 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 boots meal deal. This incredibly wasteful shooting gallery? That's a whole week's getaway in a nice Airbnb outside Norwich. Of course, however carefully I save, I always eventually end up in the red. That was a joke about counting and bleeding to death. Our fourth weapon is one I don't trust enough to use, Skippy from Cyberpunk 2077. Skippy is what would happen if the animated paperclip helper from 90s PCs was put in charge of a gun. Spoiler alert, it's really bad news, which I should probably have gleaned when I found this pistol next to a dead body in a lonely Night City alley. Not the first time I've regretted taking in an irritating stray I found down by the bins. Like the notorious paperclip assistant, Skippy often hijacks the experience, popping eardrums with poor volume control. Increasing volume by 33%. New fingerprints detected. Reminding you how many people you killed. Even firing random shots when you're minding your own business. A Merc owning Skippy is like me owning a keyboard that butts in to question everything I write. Another Delsin joke, is it? Yeah, I guess that's still pretty funny. You should do more jokes about keyboards. Beyond the whole shooting people at random thing, which is a definite gun no-no, Skippy also turns out to be surprisingly judgy. When you first activate him, you pick between a lethal and non-lethal mode. But if his kill count reaches 50 before his incapacitation count, he chooses to nope out of the killing game for good and becomes permanently non-lethal. And that's why I can never use him. A gun that refuses to fire is like a puppet that refuses to perform. This next entry goes wide, as it's practically every weapon in Dishonored 2, and a fair chunk of your reality manipulating magic powers as well. You see, what Arcane do is create some of the nastiest toys of all time, and then have Karma kick your ass if you try to use them. Imagine Rob, aged 33, his wide, innocent eyes lighting up at the possibilities of explosive whale oil containers, the human-sized bug zappers that are the walls of light, or the spring razor mine, an item that delicately combines a landmine with that machine that cuts ham into very thin slices at the supermarket meat counter. Multiply those by time-stopping or possession powers, and by my maths, that gives you... Okay, three. And that gives you 
Ah yes, that is a bloody old mess. But no, says Dishonored, there is a price to pay. Every death increases the chaos state of the world, bringing with it pestilent swarms of rats and increased hive activity from the blood flies. Just the sound of the buzzing would turn the bloodthirstiest assassin into a complete pacifist. You play nasty, the world gets nasty, culminating in increasingly bleak outcomes where heroes crush nations as despotic rulers, forever changed into soulless husks because you couldn't resist turning randos into wafer-thin ham. Dishonored 1 used the same system, but I'm picking the second game as it added subtleties to those bleak consequences and gave you a shot at limiting the chaos by using a mind-reading heart. Just go with it to see whether an NPC was innocent or a secret sinner. You can off the latter with fewer penalties, but still, you're never 100% sure you're interpreting its whispered truths correctly. We didn't set the place ablaze. No. This part was to bring the matchbox and the oil canisters. I used it on the access team and I don't think it's working. This one wonders why she's only been in one sketch this week. This man spends too much time thinking about trophies. He refuses to admit it, but he's the second biggest Star Wars fan in the office. My mistake, that last one's actually legit. Baldur's Gate 3 is an entire game built out of double-edged swords. Just look at your party. Gale, half man, half time bomb. Will, winning smile, also unbreakable demon pact. Not to mention a Starian who constantly juggles loyalty with the desire to slurp your neck like a gory calippo. I've not seen this many messed up colleagues since, well, working on access. The weapon that best encapsulates this tension is Lump's war horn. One blow and the ground will quake with my family name. Given to you by the aforementioned Lump, an ogre, it allows you to summon his ogre squad to come and do horrible ogre things with one simple toot. I've actually developed a similar system for getting refreshing drinks. I'm not falling for that. Problem is, ogre's gonna ogre. Summon them with no valid NPCs to attack, and they just attack you instead. But I know just the thing to seek my appetite. If you do manage to summon them to a fight and use their abilities, it then becomes time to pay the piper. The deal is done. Now, pay up. Although I'm the one with the horn, so technically I'm the piper. Anyway, they want payment, and this will either put a strain on your coffers as you pay up, or force you to delay payment for a later day. And do you think ogres are going to run a fair payday loans business? They do not. Make it out of Act 1 without having paid them back, and they will hunt you down and put that horn in places horns are simply not meant to go. I will crack your bones and s*** their marrow. Finally, an entry I've got to rush because it's the cursed ring from Final Fantasy VII. Whoever wears it is given death sentence at the start of battle. Oh yeah, there it is. A 60 second timer counting down to my impending doom. Thanks, cursed ring. Oh god, so little time, so much to say. Cursed ring has been in loads of Final Fantasy games. 4, 5, 6, Crisis Core. And it's really tempting. Oh god, it's tempting. Plus 35 strength and magic, plus 15 vitality, spirit and dexterity. Pretty sweet stats if you ignore the whole I'm gonna die in 60 seconds thing. That's why I put it on. 30 seconds ago, okay? I got greedy, I wanted the stats, you know? And I know technically it's an accessory and not a weapon, but it gives you strength, and strength is kind of a weapon. We don't have time to debate semantics, dead man walking here. If I did have more time, I'd tell you how Tifa Hi everyone. I'm afraid Rob didn't survive the cursed ring, so I've been asked to do this bit of the script for him. He was going to say, I'd tell you how Tifa can use the Cursed Ring to her advantage, as her Power Soul weapon actually quadruples in power when she's under the death sentence, making it a good build for her if you can win those fights quickly. Of course, I've only played Disc 1, so I don't know what any of that means, but I hope you enjoyed the feature nonetheless. Rob will be missed, and I'd like for us all to raise a can of Dr Pepper in his memory. Oh, there's one here actually, it's very useful. Please.
ステーション。